I'm a uh, chemist and an art historian, and I try to do research on uh, artwork from a chemical, physical point of view to try and safeguard um, our artwork, our heritage, and to make sure that it's passed on to the next uh, generation. Um, and uh, today I would like to talk about a specific threat that is endangering our artwork, um, something that is happening very slowly, very gradually. Um, we're unaware of it. It's happening almost invisibly. Um, and with some sense of drama, you could call it the silent killer, right? An equivalent of high blood pressure in the medical field, which you don't feel, you don't sense, until it's too late. But before I continue to talk about that, let me uh, talk about a different type of risk that is endangering our artwork, something that happened very suddenly, very violently. Um, it was in our face. I don't think anyone here in the room missed the fire on the Notre Dame. Um, this is something that was on the front page of newspapers for, for days. Um, and everyone was felt very much, um, very much, very much concerned and um, uh, felt connected to the French. Uh, there was this massive response in, in France itself. Um, right, uh, the French people collected more than a billion euros. It's an enormous amount of money. A billion euros. And within four weeks after the fire itself, the French Agency for Heritage said, um, thank you, we, we have enough money now. Thank you very much, but stop giving us money. And it is something that happens seldomly, right, in, um, in the heritage field. At least I haven't um, witnessed something like this. Um, and then the question becomes, why is that? Why was there such a massive response? And that has everything to do with um, the nature of heritage, the nature of, of artworks, um, because we all identify with that. And the French certainly identify with the Notre Dame, which is a symbol of who the French are and how they have become what they are today. Um, the church witnessed the coronation of all the kings of, of France. It has seen the violence of the French Revolution. Um, it has seen the coronation of, of Napoleon um, it is um, the topic of a great novel by Victor Hugo, um, which features uh, an uh, important figure, the Hunchback of Notre Dame, which later on continued and continues to inspire Hollywood. Um, it is, of course, the stage where state funerals take place. So every president of the French Republic has, been, has, has had his, his, uh, his funeral in the Notre Dame. So this is really about who the French are and again what they have become and how they have developed over time. And that strength of heritage at the same time is also its weakness. When Jews can't be in Germany, when Muslims are no longer welcome in Europe, when Buddhists can't live in Afghanistan and when um, ancient antiquity is no longer tolerated in Syria, we destroy their heritage. Um, and that has happened in the past, that continues today, and it also will continue in the future. Um, and in a world that is getting more and more global, with more and more identities living together on a smaller planet, if you will, with other grand challenges that um, address the energy transition, materials, scarcity, coastal defense, um, mass immigration. The question becomes, how do we make sure that we pass on our heritage to our children? Because that is just like these other grand challenges, um, a question of sustainability. And I'm now going to show you a little movie that is both funny 
and provocative at the same time, and it addresses exactly that question. That's for 869. So what you just saw is a, a painting that self-destructs. A painting made by the British artist uh, Banksy, who uh, constructed this self-destructive, self-destruction mechanism with the intent to, to activate once and if the painting is ever sold at an auction, which you just saw happening, right? It was hammered off at a million euros or you know, lots of money, and then after that it immediately uh, self-destructs. And you could see how people some people were laughing, others were shocked, others were getting angry, right? And that's exactly the type of, 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 of trigger that, um, that the artist wanted to play with. My point today is that we don't need self-destructing art for art to be self-destructive, because modern art is already self-destructive. There are all kinds of effects on modern paintings, and I'm showing you a couple of these effects right here. These are detailed photographs of paintings that show delamination, that show discoloration, that show effects of oxidation, that shows, show all kinds of chemical pathways that are threatening our artwork. And in many of these cases, we don't know what the underlying chemistry is. So uh, we're not even aware of it in many cases. So the question then becomes, um, you know, if we don't know what, what the underlying mechanisms are, what can we do to stop it or to slow it down or even reverse it? We have no knowledge about that or hardly any knowledge about it. And to make things even worse, um, there are mechanisms that we know will happen or are likely to happen in the future, um, but haven't, th those mechanisms haven't happened yet. So here you see a painting, a very important painting by Piet Mondrian, famous Dutch 20th century artist on the left, and a, Bel and a Belgian bus stop on the right. What do these two have in common? They both contain paint, paint mixtures, that are very unstable. In the case of the bus stop, we see how these yellow stripes are slowly discoloring and are turning into a pale white color. Um, and the mechanism that you see here has everything to do with the photocatalysis of titanium white. A um, bright PhD student of mine, <coughs> Birgit van Drill, has just written her uh, PhD thesis about this uh, effect, and she uh, uh, actually revealed the mechanism. She showed just how this, um, this process of degradation occurs, what the mechanism is, and what we could possibly do against it. The point is that this effect is threatening much of our artwork. So if you look at all major artists of the 20th century, ranging from Piet Mondrian to Jasper Jones, Pablo Picasso, Jackson Pollock, Willem de Koning, right, all icons of 20th century art, they all used titanium white, this pigment that has this photocatalytical effect on its environment. Um, and uh, we have no idea at the moment um, how bad it is, how reactive these paintings are, and we should do something against it. We should really investigate this more thoroughly in order to take action, to be able to take action before it's too late. And that is exactly why we need a joint effort. Um, we need more awareness for these effects uh, in the museums, in the modern art museums. Uh, we need more awareness of this uh, in the art market, art dealers, auction houses. Uh, I think the, in the insurance industry should be, should be aware of this because we're dealing with lots of money and risk, so you immediately are dealing with, with insurances. Um, we should um, address this also from an academic point of view. I think we need more research into effects like this. 
Uh, but there's one group of people that should also be aware of this, um, and that is the museum visitor, that is the taxpayer, that is the public, that is actually you. Thank you very much.